I didn't really want to want to stop singing. I don't know if you did. That thing on? I'm there. There I am. I, I really thought about just. Um, I don't know, Michael. I just really was getting in. Like I don't know this. I love Christmas songs, don't you? And so, like, I'm not done singing. Like, I just want to keep singing these great, these great, rich songs that, to be honest, that say stuff so much better than I feel like I say stuff most of the time. You know what I mean? Like, there's some weird cultural collision that happens, isn't there? Like, we can sing Jingle Bells, we can sing Batman Smells, and we can sing Rudolph, but, man, you come into First Noel, and you're like, good night. I mean, how they just captured just the visual language has always impressed me about, about Christmas time. It's in the biblical narrative, but it's also in the Christmas hymns. It's just visually rich language. The way they, they it's like you, they're trying to paint a picture in your mind. That's the whole point of it all. And it's all pointing to, to Jesus. And uh, one of the interesting things too, I think about uh, the New Testament, and obviously uh, just the incredible richness there. But you know, only two of the gospels give us the nativity account. You ever wonder why that is? That's interesting. Well, that's a, that's a sermon for another day. But what I am always drawn to at Christmas time is that even though John doesn't specifically talk about what happened in Bethlehem, you know, rather John points to the kind of the pre-existence, the eternality of Jesus, like he was there in the beginning and nothing was created that has been created without him. He points to the word, the logos in the beginning, maybe as a corrective, and just in case we start thinking that Jesus came into existence 2,000 years ago, John's like saying, hello, knock, knock. He was there in the beginning. And so, but he was the word made flesh, and he is the, his, his life was the, the light of men. That's what he says. That light shined in the darkness, yet the darkness did not overcome it. And he makes that visual connection. Every time I sing a Christmas song, First Noel, um, or even, oh, come all ye faithful, you know, come to Bethlehem and see. There's this big, impressive statements about seeing this audio-visual event. And that's not lost on John. Again, even without the nativity in there, I think it's very much connected to at the, the, the heart of Christmas. That God was doing something he wanted you to see. Isn't that cool? He was doing something he didn't want to keep as a secret anymore. And it was like he was inviting all these people to come and witness for themselves and take all this in for themselves in a very visual way. And uh, Christmas is all about seeing. I, you think about your childhood Christmas. I know there's some kids in here, and you're already going to know what I'm talking about. But if you're an adult, you think about your favorite aspect of Christmas on Christmas morning as a kid. What is it? It's, you want to see, I mean, even before your parents are out there, you charge into the living room like I did, and you just want to see what's there. And to be honest with you, a lot of it's already been there. A lot of it I've already seen already, but this is a different kind of seeing because we know today is the day when I'm going to hold that, whatever that is, it's going to become mine. I'm going to see it, but I'm also going to touch it. And I'm going to behold it. I'm going to, I'm going to unwrap it. And I'm kind of getting ahead of myself because that sounds a lot like the prologue in 1 John when he says, what we have heard, what, what we have seen, what we have touched, we've declared, I won't, I won't steal my own thunder. But this is, this is the heart of Christmas. It's the heart of Christmas, this experience where we get to see what God was doing and what God is doing it, because Christmas can be seen. So let's just jump right into to where we're going today with the very first point. It's, uh, you can open your Bibles if you want to. We'll put some of that stuff on the screen. I, I always enjoy reading it in my own Bible personally. I never get offended when someone uses a translation um, that's not what I'm reading. I think there's richness in that. I like being able to do the comparison. Someone's the translation's on the screen and mine's different. It's actually helping me with the meaning. There's some different words. Like my kids, they're kind of young. That kind of throws them off. They're like, I don't, if it's not the same, it's hard for me to follow. As you become an adult, you realize that actually is very beneficial sometimes. So open your Bible. Don't just, don't just rely on the screen um, because here's what we're going to look at just real quick. Christmas invites us to see Jesus with our eyes. What a great, what a great reality. Well, how do we know that? Well, we look at this in the, in the, in the narratives that God's use of lights is everywhere. Look at this stage this morning. Have you seen the lights everywhere? Isn't this awesome? Like the Christmas lights are, are everywhere on the front, on the back, on the sides. This is, this is painting part of the biblical picture. Actually, no, it's not just Western commercialism. If you look at the narrative, God's use of lights is, is this stuff is really dim compared to that, actually. He'd blow us all away. So as Jesus being the light of the world, all these things are coming, all these ideas are coming together on purpose, and I want you to see that. 
Because God's use of light is very intentional here, namely from the star in Bethlehem, but also from the angels. In Luke chapter 2 and verse 15, here's what it says. When the angels had left them, that's the shepherds, and returned to heaven, the shepherds said to one another, let's go straight to Bethlehem and see what has happened, which the Lord has made known to us. That word see is the, is the word idomen, edo. There's a couple of different Greek words, blepo, edo. These are just common words for the word see, and I'll come back to that, but that's what they're saying, idomen. We, let's go and see, let's set our eyes on what has happened there. And then Matthew, um, of course, in a different passage about a different people group, the Magi, in Matthew chapter 2, it says, after hearing the king, they went on their way, and there it was, the star they had seen in the east it led them until it came and stopped above the place where the child was. And when they saw the star, they were overjoyed beyond measure. And entering the house, they saw, that's Idon, Greek, they saw the child with his, with his mother, of Mary, his mother. And falling to their knees, they worshipped him and they opened their treasures and presented him with gifts, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. This is so fascinating. You, 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 we get the impression that they understood that this light, these this things that they were seeing, these visual lights, were not an end in and of themselves. And here's how, right? Because I think when on the hillside in Bethlehem, when those shepherds see these angels, there's no desire for them to kind of linger and hang out after the message is done. I think I find that totally fascinating. It's, you'd think that like, oh yeah, there's those angels again. No, but, but after they've kind of made their announcement, the shepherds are going, hey, wait, 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 before this is over, hey, no, we're going to go check out this Christ child like you're talking about, but, you know, we're just, we're just kind of wondering, like, yeah, will we ever see you again? Like, will we see you again? Like, they don't care anything about that. Immediately, it's like a bullseye. They said, let's, let's go and see for ourselves. Yeah, I don't know if on nights that followed in Bethlehem, if they were, like, looking up, if they, if they ever, you know, from that moment forward, they wondered whether or not there would be another one. But clearly they recognize that the significance of that event was really the substance of the message. The same thing for the Magi. Aren't you glad they didn't just stay put somewhere in the east and have a party and invite their friends and say, you're never going to believe this. There's this star and we're just going to celebrate in the light of this star tonight because it's so significant and try to rally people just to see how important this was. We kind of do that in our culture, but they didn't do that. It sets wheels in motion for them to start this huge journey that takes them into Bethlehem. And then after getting that consultation from the Jewish experts on where to go, that they follow that star and it's all about this child. It's all about Jesus. That's what the lights are supposed to point us to as well. I, I just want to say that to you and encourage you um, because in our culture we have visual cues. If you do Advent at your house, you have candles in a, in a traditional Advent wreath, you might have lights on your house. We'll see different, just visual, just certain colors in our culture. All those things signify Christmas. And so if I can help you, prevent you from being too curmudgeon -y at Christmas time to be like, oh, this commercialism, what a beautiful opportunity that we have to, in a very uh, casual, in a, in a very uh, open way, in a very natural way, simply talk about what this all means. Why, why lights are so significant, but we can just make that connection and, and help people and point people to the, to the um, reality of who Jesus is. So please don't abandon, don't, get, don't lose heart and say, well, we're just not going to do all this commercial stuff. Like, hey, I welcome all that stuff. Because my neighbors, I don't care if they've got minions in their front yard or a nativity scene. It's an opportunity for me to talk about why that's significant. You know, because all that stuff, you, you set it up in the day, but you know why? It's for nighttime. That's why it's there. Why? Because at night it it lights up. That's what John says in his prologue. The light shines in the darkness, yet the darkness did not overcome it. And it's awesome at nighttime in, in neighborhoods around Sarasota with those Christmas lights up. That's a chance for you to point people like those shepherds. We don't get hung up on the lights. I talk to my kids about, can you imagine the glory of Jesus? That's what all this is for. And you know, the crazy thing is, God is so great and so good, these people don't even know it. They're setting up lights, they don't even know who this is for. And you can tell them who this is for. What a great opportunity. So, hey, don't shut down. Don't get too bogged down in commercialism. This is exactly what the Apostle Paul did in Acts chapter 17. 
in Athens when he's in Mars Hill in the Areopagus and he's walking around a city that's completely saturated with idols. There's an altar to an, to an unknown God and he takes that one artifact and walks into the Areopagus and says, let me tell you about this God that is yet to this moment unknown to you, but he actually made everything. And he, and he, and he complete, shares this beautiful picture of the gospel. And at the end of his presentation, and there, are, there were some places, you know this, if you look at the book of Acts, where people get hostile, where, where Paul was actually stoned, where people start like, like grabbing people and dragging people, this, not on this occasion. See, Paul just takes an artifact from their own culture and says, let me, let me set the context for what, why this is, this is significant. Let me tell you about the God that actually you don't know. And at the conclusion of his talk, they don't call the, the temple guards, they don't call the Roman soldiers. It says some of them believed. Some of them, not, not necessarily, some of them wanted to hear more. He just started a conversation. What a great impression, what a great opportunity we have to be an, an Apostle Paul in Acts chapter 17 at Christmas time in, in, the, in Western culture. It's not offensive to talk about Christ. It wasn't offensive for him to talk about that altar to an unknown God. They're thinking that's kind of interesting. It's not going to be offensive for you to talk about the decorations in someone else's house or someone else's yard. We can use that. And I, I think there's another sermon for another day that can talk about how the meta narrative of Scripture is really everything that we enjoy in entertainment and media. All the great stories that have been told have, have borrowed from the meta narrative, from the bigger, from God's story. We've all borrowed. But I want to give you, um, before I get into the one I want to show you about, I, got, I took some pictures of your yard. I think this is your yard right here. Is this your front yard? There's this thing that has happened. It's not just lights anymore. See, it's inflatables now. See, inflatables are taking over the world. Check this next one out. There's some real commitment in this yard. And here's how you know this is real commitment, because, you know, it takes a lot of power. It draws a lot of power to run those little fan motors. And so most people just let them deflate in the, in the daytime. But these guys are running at full steam in the daytime, right? So these things, you can use... You can use these things to point people to Jesus. It might sound kind of crazy, but you know what? Hey, if you can't appreciate this one, then you just take a picture of it. Someone else will explain it to you, but I'm just saying. That's a really cool one. Never seen that one in real life yet, but maybe. Um, but, you know, all that's pointing to a person that's more significant. There's this last one with these kids up there, just lights. I mean, it just kind of captures, there's just something, you know, in the mind of a child, um, it just, uh, those, those lights, they just do something. They just take you somewhere different. We can redirect that. You can tell people the point. You can use stuff like this. It sounds crazy, but you can use that. Why? Because this is all borrowed. This stuff is all borrowed from a much bigger picture in, in Scripture. There's actually one. I know Dr. Seuss has kind of been canceled lately, you know, but it doesn't matter. Uh, the Grinch is still a huge part of a lot of people's Christmas. So you know, you're familiar with this book or this animated film called How the Grinch Stole Christmas. And I love that picture in particular because look what he's taking off the top of that tree. Again, that's John, that's the prologue in John, right? The light shines in the darkness, but the darkness is not overcome. He's going to put that star right down in that sack because the Grinch's plan, if you remember, his, his, his very famous statement as he's looking down into Whoville, he's saying, I must stop, I must keep Christmas from coming. That's, his, that's, the, whole, that's the whole plot of the whole thing. I must stop Christmas from coming. And so what's his plan? Well, his plan is to go house by house and eliminate every single piece of Christmas swag from those annoying little who's down in Whoville. And he takes all their decorations, he takes all their presents, he even takes the roast beast. I mean, that's kind of, the, wow, you even take that, wow, that's really bad. But he just leaves cobwebs, you know, it's just empty rooms. Where there was Christmas stuff, he takes all of it away. House by house he goes, he says, here's how I'll stop Christmas from coming. I'll eliminate all of this, of this stuff. Well, you know, the Gospel of Matthew kind of tells, where, where, where does Dr. Seuss borrow that from? Well, I'll tell you where he borrows that from. It says in, in the Gospel of Matthew that following the exit of the Magi, who were warned to leave by a different route in a dream, King Herod, it's not, instead of the Grinch, it's King Herod. And instead of going house by house and taking away the Christmas swag, the Bible says that Herod sent soldiers to eliminate every baby boy under the age of two. So it's not Whoville, it's Bethlehem. And it's not Christmas stuff, it's babies. Because the news that this one, the king of the Jews has come, he says, I gotta keep this Christmas from coming. I gotta keep my kingdom intact. See, Dr. Seuss caught that, he, he borrowed that, but did it work? No, it, it didn't work. 
As the Grinch was surprised, it still didn't stop Christmas from coming. God's sovereignty protected his one and only son. They, they hightail it for, for Egypt. And so even his best efforts to snuff out Christmas didn't come to fruition. Now, we live in a culture, I don't know, that, that, that section of the, of the nativity is so difficult. It's called the massacre of the innocents. We talk about what Herod did there. That's so tragic, but we dare not just think, well, that, wow, that must have been so tragic. I can't deal with that. That's literally what's happening in our culture today, and that's not a political statement. That's a statement about what, what we are doing to the unborn as a society. So we need to check ourselves. We come to a scripture like that and say, oh, I can't even think about that. Guys, it's happening all around us. Now, the motive is different, but it's just as serious. But coming back to the text this morning, um, we can use those Christmas lights to tell people about Christ. So don't let those lights lose their meaning. It's borrowed. They're borrowing from God's picture. You can help bring people back to the whole point. Just don't let those lights get meaning, get lost in your eyes. See, that's the problem. Don't let the lights of Christmas and the meaning of who those point to be lost in your eyes. And every time they get your attention, consider the light of the world. Consider Jesus who came into the world, yet the darkness did not overcome him. But here's the other side of that, right? So the lights need further explanation. That's where this is going. The, the shepherds got theirs on the hillside. The magi got theirs from the Jewish experts. And it brings us to point number two. Christmas invites us to see Jesus with our minds. So his invitation, God's capturing people's attention with the lights. But it isn't just supposed to stop there. There's other information that comes. There's a use, God's use of language. So that's how we see Jesus with our eyes. It's through the use of language. In other words, God always invites us to an active relationship, not a passive encounter. And so the visual encounters in the biblical text include a message of language that had to be considered. Let me give you a couple of those. Uh, one is in Matthew chapter 2. Um, verse 20 is just some of the language. This is a really short encounter again when Mary and Joseph and Jesus are in Egypt. An angel comes back to Joseph in a dream. He says, get up, take the child and his mother and go to the land of Israel because those who sought the child's life are dead. In Luke chapter 1, this is um, talking about Gabriel and Mary. It says, in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a town in Galilee called Nazareth to a virgin engaged to a man named Joseph, the house of David. The virgin's name was Mary. Then the angel told her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. Now listen, you will conceive and give birth to a son, and you will call his name Jesus. So again, there's the lights are, are there, and certainly if an angel appeared and, and had a conversation with you today, that'd be pretty overwhelming, but it isn't just the visual thing that God wants to make an impression with a star or a messenger, we got to tune in to the content. There's, a, there's an explanation that's coming with that, and we cannot miss that and get caught up on the lights as if they're an end in and of themselves. And I want to illustrate this to you. The Bible does it too. It's so fascinating to me also as a student of the scriptures how, much, how, how many accounts in the scripture are really quite embarrassing. They're really quite embarrassing for the person for whom the text is about which is one of the reasons why apologists point to the authenticity of Scripture. It doesn't hold anything back. And one of those men is named Zechariah, and he is giving uh, his service as a priest in Luke chapter 1. If, if you probably know this, you know this about Christmas time, and if I had you to, like, to list all the names associated with Christmas, all the places associated with Christmas, you'd create a huge list. One of the names that should be on your list is a guy named Zechariah, because the pregnancy of Elizabeth and Mary was, were coinciding together, and this angelic announcement was also happening for both of these babies to be born. And so here's Zechariah. He's a priest. He's, an, he's well along in years, kind of like, a, um, for his time, a modern-day a modern Abraham kind of person, right? He and his wife Elizabeth have been un, unable to have children. That would have been a heart's desire of theirs, but he's a priest, and he's about to get a really important message. And I want to read to you some of that message, um, starting in Luke chapter 1 verse 5. So turn there or read on the screen. Uh, here we go. This is uh, Zechariah gets visited in the temple. It says, in the days of King Herod of Judea, there was a priest of Abijah's division named Zechariah. His wife was, the daughter, uh, was from the daughters of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. Both were righteous in God's sight, living without blame according to all the commands and requirements of the Lord, but they had no children because Elizabeth could not conceive, and both of them were well along in years. 
when his division was on duty and he was serving as priest before God, it happened that he was chosen by lot according to the custom of the priesthood to enter the sanctuary of the Lord and to burn incense. At the hour of incense, the whole assembly of the people was praying outside. Let me just stop you there, right there, because this is, this is, we need to know this about kind of the context. This is a once in a life, as a priest, this is a once in a lifetime appointment to come and offer incense in the holy place. Not the holy of holies, that's the place where the priest would go annually to offer that, that annual sacrifice for sin, but the, the incense offering is in, is in the holy place, not the holy of holies, but it's still super important. It's a super high privilege, a super high honor, the lot falls to Zechariah, and here in his old age, he's thinking, man, it's finally my turn to offer this incense. Now, you need to know this, too. Think about context, people. This is Luke chapter 1. We're entering the scene after 400 years of complete prophetic silence from God. As we close the book on Malachi, and we open to the New Testament, it has been four centuries since anybody has said anything to say concerning a prophetic word from God. God has been completely silent. You know, in, the, in Samuel's account, you know, when God is raising it and he's in the temple and there's this thing where God appears to him in a dream and he thinks it's Eli calling him. It says, it, it, the disclaimer before that whole narrative in Samuel is the word from the Lord in those days was rare. I want to tell you, in Zechariah's day, he's an old man now, a word from the Lord was just about extinct. It was like unheard of. Four centuries, no one's heard from the Lord. And so it's his turn, he gets to go into this, and then, and then here's what's about to happen to good old Zechariah. In verse 11, an angel of the Lord appeared to him, standing to the right of the altar of incense. So listen, remember, this isn't a normal thing. Like, there was no like, oh, sometimes, you know, sometimes God shows up and he talks to his priest. Yeah, sometimes he's there, sometimes not. He's never there. No one's ever seen one there. He hasn't been here in centuries. We haven't heard a word from God in centuries. So you hope that this, what's happening isn't lost on him, but listen to what happens. The angel of the Lord appeared to him standing at the right side of the altar of incense, and when Zechariah saw him, he was startled, yeah, no joke, and overcome with fear. But the angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zechariah, because your prayer has been heard. Your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you will name him John. There will be joy and delight for you, and Mary will rejoice at his birth, for he will be great in the sight of the Lord and will never drink wine or beer. He will be filled with the Holy Spirit while still in his mother's womb. He will turn away this he will turn sorry, he will turn many of the sons of Israel to the Lord their God, and he will go before him in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of fathers to their children and the disobedient to the understanding of the righteous to make ready for the Lord, the Lord a prepared people. That's a pretty incredible message. Pretty incredible message. But look at what Zechariah says next. He says, how can I know this? Zechariah asked the angel, for I am an old man, and my wife is well along in years. And the angel answered him, I am Gabriel who stands in the presence of God, and I was sent to speak to you and tell you this good news. Now listen, you will become silent and unable to speak until the day these things take place, because you did not believe my words, which will be fulfilled in their proper time. Whoa. All right, so let me give you another, another piece of context here, because what happens is, um, well, let's just read it. Look at verse, verse 21. It says, Meanwhile, the people were waiting for Zechariah, amazed that he stayed so long in the sanctuary. Here's why. Do you know this about the annual sacrifice, the Holy of Holies? You know, they put a rope on that priest, and he's got these bells on, and as long as the bells are jingling, everything is good. Why is the rope on there? Well, they can't go in there, because there's an understanding that to be in the presence of God is a serious risk of life. There is a very real chance that in the presence, in the Shekinah glory of God, you, if something goes wrong, if there's some uncleanness attached to you, God, God might just strike you dead because he's a holy God. So here would be a normal operating procedure for going into the holy place because we're getting close. 
and offering incense. The incense would, would be lit. The smoke would start to go up. And that priest would try to come out pretty much as soon as possible because this whole congregation had gathered outside the holy place and they were waiting for the priest who went in and had this honor to do this to lead them in reciting the blessing from Numbers. And so that guy would come out and he would say the section of the blessing from the book of Numbers and it would be like a responsive reading. He would say part of it, they would repeat it back. He would say the next part, they would repeat it back. So you want to get in and out and come out and do that part. Well, he's not only been there forever, they're like, what's taking this guy so long? But when he comes out, he can't say anything. God's been silent for 400 years. No one's heard a single thing. Zechariah hears it. And now the one thing that he can't do is share that message with the, with the whole host of people there. Can you imagine how ironic that is? That is so crazy ironic. And they're going, what? He's, this is like what he's been waiting for. We're waiting for him to lead us. And he's not, so they suppose, man, he's obviously, he's seen something. He's probably gesturing with something that's happened. They don't know what's going on. But see, he didn't believe. Now, we'll tell you this just real fast. There's a point in, um, in uh, biblical commentaries you hear people talk about, they'll make a joke about the language of heaven. You ever wonder that? What language are they going to speak in heaven? Well, the Hebrew scholars say, well, obviously they're going to speak Hebrew. Well, how do we know that? Well, because the messengers that, you know, that God sends, we know two of them. One of them is named Gabriel, and one of them is named Michael. Those are very Hebrew names, so... So I'll be in good shape. See, my name's Jared. That's a very old school Hebrew name. So I don't know about you, but your name, in tough luck, it's going to be Hebrew in heaven, I guess. I'll have to do a lot of <laughs> those kind of things at the beginning of words, you know. <laughs> but no, I'm just kidding. It's actually not. What we, what we don't do is look at that text for when we see like, Gabe, here's the angel Gabriel. Really, and that's kind of a joke that they say, but really what, what we're, we're supposed to focus on is really the meaning of that name. It isn't so much that's what he's, but the function of that name and what his purpose is. See, you want to see Gabriel because his name means man of God or messenger of God. So you don't want to see Michael. Michael is, his name means who is like the Lord. So Michael gets sent. He's like the, the leader of the archangel of the army. He comes in to, to annihilate, to destroy, when some lofty thing has been brought up against the name of God. He comes in. You can read about that in Daniel. So he's like battling the army. Like he's the one you bring in to wipe things out. Gabriel's the guy you bring in to demonstrate when there's, a, when there's a grace moment, when there's a message moment. This is the guy you want showing up to deliver the message. And it, it is grace. Because you know what? Zechariah's not struck dead. 400 years of silence. Can you imagine the frustration? Really? You're going you're gonna to ask me, like, do it? But he's just simply told that you're not going to be able to speak. I mean, even that's a pretty gracious thing considering the situation. What happened with Zechariah? See, he lost he lost, he lost sight of the big picture. Now, if you're a parent and you've got kids, and even if you're a grandparent and you've got grandkids, there are two words in my house that are so used, they're almost overused, and they're kind of pointless, but the two words, one is a contraction, really, but, it's, you know, it's, I, but the two words are, I'm hungry. Do you hear this word? Oh, my goodness. I, I, hear, I mean, it must be like every 30 minutes, I, somebody's saying this. I mean, 30 minutes after we ate, somebody's hungry, you know what I mean? And it's always... Right after we brush teeth before bed, I'm hungry. You know, when they're little, it's kind of cute, right? So when kids are learning to talk, you, you know, they're hungry, and they're like, I'm hungry, Daddy. It's kind of like, oh, you're hungry. You know, we'll get a, get a whatever, a fruit snack or goldfish or whatever. But then, um, and we kind of actually encourage that from our kids when they're little, like, oh, are you, are you hungry? You must be hungry. And like, yeah, they're like, yeah, I'm hungry. But see, when they get older, oh, no, 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 no. It's a completely different tempo. It's a completely different exchange now. It's like, it's like this mix of, some, most of the time, it's a mix of like frustration or anger. It's just like erupts into a volcano. It's like, I'm hungry! You know, it's just like all of a sudden, I'm hungry! They're like making this public service announcement. I don't know if they're, I think it's mostly anger though, but I can't really figure out if it's like anger because they were so busy doing something and they're frustrated because they're angry because now they, anger sneaked up. Well, great, now, now I'm hungry. I don't have time for this. Dad, I'm hungry! Yeah. I don't know if it's that. Or if it's just the anger that they like, obviously that, that their parents just aren't really appreciating the nature of the situation. So they got to like get hostile about it, you know, because you don't appreciate the fact that I'm hungry. But I do this dad joke thing with my, with my kids, you know, and sometimes they say, I'm hungry. I'd be like, hey, nice to meet you, hungry. I'm daddy. <laughs> you know, and they're like, I'm hungry. And I'll, I'll just say it again. I, I mean, I, come on, people. I mean, can, can they not appreciate the sense of humor in that moment? Like, you're not, you're not, did you see what I did there? Like, with the, did you see what I did with that phrase? How you said you're hungry, and I said, I said, I'm daddy. They, they just don't appreciate that. It's like, it's like Lord of the Rings. Like, you think that, like, I have the ring. Like, that's the, I have all the food, and it's like the one ring, and they're like, you know, Gollum coming after the ring. Like, it's their precious. I need the food. It's my precious. And I'm like, 
Nice to meet you, hungry. I'm daddy. That doesn't go over. They don't really laugh at that, so thank you for the mercy laughs of some of you in this room. I find it incredibly satisfying and very, very funny when I use that with them. Um, but coming back to um, what's happening here, he has Zechariah, he says, hey, how, how can this, how can I know this? In essence, Gabriel's like, did you not catch who sent me here? And that's the deal with my kids. I'm like, hey, I'm daddy. You know what that means is like, if you're hungry, I probably already know that you're hungry. And the fact that there isn't like food in your hand doesn't mean that I've forgotten to feed you for the rest of your life. It just means that like the plan that me and your mom have, we're like, we're working on that. We just haven't clued you in on that. So just don't forget who you're talking to. You know, when you're like, I'm hungry. And you're like, number one, I'm your dad. Okay. So we need to have some, some respect things happening, but also you're not really appreciating who I am because unless I get food for you today, like you're not going to eat basically, right? I mean, hey, there we go, parents. Give yourself a trophy. That's right. You're the provider. So it's kind of like just a reality check. Just remember who you're talking to because you are going to get fed. All right? I don't want to put you in your place, but just remember who you're talking to right now because I already understand that. That's what, so Gabriel kind of does the same thing. He says, hey, how can, I, how can I know this? And Gabriel's like, do you not catch who sent me here to you? Actually, if you, look at, if you want to look at the technical sense of the statements in the Greek or uh, structure, uh, Scholars would tell you that Gabriel's response is, is built on the last thing that Zechariah said. And the last thing he said was about his wife and his old age. In essence, he's saying, I'm an old man. So my kids say, I'm hungry. And I say, I'm daddy. He says, I'm old. And Gabriel says, I'm Gabriel. That's what he's saying. He's like, maybe you forgot. Maybe you missed that. Let's just start over. Did you? I'm Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God, and he's sent me here to you to give you this good news. Hello? Did you, for, did you forget who I am? And the answer is, well, yes. He completely forgot. I, this is, but this is us. So embarrassing for Zechariah. And I'm not trying to be too hard on him. We do the same thing. Have you ever talked to somebody about the good news of Jesus, and somehow the topic became objectionable? Maybe that's been you. Someone's trying to share some spiritual thing about who Jesus is and what he's done, and, and something just like starts rubbing us the wrong way because somehow we, we, think, we think that we're different than most people, and so uh, God certainly doesn't expect me to immediately get on board with what he's going to say because I've, I, I need a little extra something to go on here. And Maybe for most people that's fine, but not for me. Because, see, we tend to let circumstances and those kind of things like overshadow the content and the significance of what's really happening. See, that's what he did. He's like, man, I, I, am, I am old. You know, how, how can, so how can I know this? And Gabriel's like, check your source, bro. Do you, do you not know who I am? Have you checked the last 400 years on your calendar? This does not happen. I'm pretty sure Gabriel was expecting a different response. I just think in, in, my, in his mind, he must have seen this a lot different. Don't you think? I, I think he would have seen this a lot different. When God speaks, we got to see God with our minds. When God, when God speaks, the next time he speaks to you, turn your brain on and don't let the content of the message and the significance of exactly who the message is from overshadow. Or, sorry, don't let the, your circumstances overshadow that. Think about who this, who this is from. We talk about Christmas and what happened. Think about the significance of this. In light of the gospel, we're living in a culture who are, they get offended. They have reasons. And they haven't really understood the significance. Wow, what a grace gift. This is how the writer of Hebrews says it. In Hebrews chapter 1, um, verses 1 through 2, it says, Long ago before God, uh, long ago God spoke to the fathers by the prophets at different times and in different ways. In these last days he has spoken to us by his son, so think about that. There's kind of a quality difference, don't you think? He's spoken to us by his son. God has appointed him heir of all things and made the universe through him. Then skip over to chapter 2. He bookends that as we consider the content of the gospel. Chapter 2, starting in verse 1. We must therefore pay even more attention to what we have heard so that we will not drift away. For the message spoken through angels was legally binding and every transgression and disobedience received a just punishment. How will we escape? if we neglect such a great salvation. Check the source. Wake up. See the significance of what has 
happen, before we start getting all concerned about what can't happen until we check the source, Zechariah lost sight of that. But you know what? I don't think he'd make that mistake twice. And I think when John was born, people, people couldn't wait to hear what really happened in that holy place once his lips were loose to be able to speak about what God had done. It was amazing. Turn our minds on. We're not just get captured by the sights, but Christmas invites us to see Jesus with our minds too. Look at the content. Look at the language. Let all that sink in. It's a big deal. Here's the third thing I want you to see this morning. Christmas invites us to see Jesus with our hearts. To see Jesus with our hearts because Jesus is God's gift of life. Let me just read to you. I, I want to say a couple things to you, but I want to read to you. If you have your Bibles, do this. Open it to the, to the book of 1 John. I want to read you some of the prologue in 1 John. And hear what, listen to what he says about, about Jesus, about his experience. And I'll, I'll try to unpack this for you. Um, and we'll kind of leave this as our, as our closing point this morning. This is 1 John 1, verse 1. He says, What was from the beginning, what we have heard, what we have seen with our eyes, what we have observed and have touched with our hands concerning the word of life, that life was revealed, and we have seen it, and we testify and declare to you the eternal life that was with the Father who was revealed to us. Verse 3, what we have seen and heard, we also declare to you so that you may have fellowship along with us. And indeed, our fellowship is with the Father and His Son, Jesus Christ. See, Jesus is the life. And before we ever talk about, and this is a problem for us in our culture, before we ever talk about qualifying the abundant life of believers that Jesus promised, we need to get back to the starting line and see what this, why this is really significant in the first place. Namely, if we feel like we've already got a pretty good life, then we're missing the eternal significance of this. And that is going to be the problem for probably a lot of us trying to um, tell other people about Jesus in a city like Sarasota where, where affluence is so prevalent. So leading with this line, you know, Jesus is the life. Well, for people who feel like their life is already pretty good, that doesn't seem too significant. But the problem is that the Bible calls us to a paradigm shift. See, it's a really bad place to start. If we start evaluating our spiritual condition based on our like physical health, our mental health, and our social status, those are really bad, really poor places from which to draw spiritual conclusions. But that's exactly what people do. Because if you ask them about what it takes to go to heaven, they're going to say, just be a good person. Almost unanimously, if they don't say it directly, the content of what they will say leads precisely to that. Just be a good person. And for people, hey, I feel like I'm a pretty good person and I'm having a pretty good life. Well, Jesus is alive. Oh, well, good. So we got to come up with things. So to appeal to people, to, to go around the biblical paradigm and say, well, your life is good, but it could be better. Maybe that'll hook people. Your life is really great, but what if it could be the best? So we, we, that's the wrong starting point. What's the message of the Bible? That we're, we're not, it's not that we have this life that's okay and God wants to make it better. So we're dead. We're absolutely dead. In our sins, that's Ephesians 2, we're dead in our trespasses and our sins. And unless God comes and does something about that, we're going to feel really good about going straight to hell until we get there. And then we're like, well, what went wrong? And then there's going to be some, something that's now irreversible. It's too late now. But John says, we're declaring this to you so that you can have fellowship with God and fellowship with with us. So when Jesus is the life, when, when the little baby Jesus is born as the sacrificial lamb of God who comes to take away the sin of the world, it wasn't so you could have a better life. It was because you were, you were destined for eternal punishment. It's because you were dead. And every person who has come into existence as a result of Adam and Eve has been born spiritually dead. Now, with the exception of Jesus, well, why? Well, Adam wasn't his daddy. So he didn't carry that sin nature. So he could die for you. He could die for me. 
and that was acceptable. That's another sermon for another day. But the bottom line is we're, we're born into this world and we're dead. So when John says, this is the life, we, Jesus is the life, and that light was the life of men. That's a significant thing that we don't need to ignore for people who are spiritually dead. And I want to take you to, can I take you to some language things? Can I do a little thing that, um, a little geeky Greek with you this morning? Because when you read a passage like this to us in English, we read things the shepherd saw, the magi saw, you know, people see. So John's saying what we have seen. But you, in your English Bible, you're not going to catch that John is, those words are different words. So they're not using the same word in every one of those contexts. And I want to help you see this, because I think this is the heart of Christmas, of what John is trying to get at in 1 John chapter 1. Because, you know, one of the things that John includes himself, actually, if you look in the Gospels in John chapter 20, if you're familiar with the passage on Resurrection Sunday, and the ladies come back from the tomb, they're like, we, and, and, the, and the disciples don't believe it. Well, the two that take off make a beeline for the tomb, it's John and it's Peter. And if you see what John says, that John, when he got to the tomb, he, look, he looked in, there's a Greek word, blepo, it's similar to the edo word we talked about earlier, when people see, they saw, edo, those are, those are the two most common words for see, just the visual impression. You know, hey, oh, I saw, I saw whatever, name, name something over there. Well, you said, that's that word blepo John uses. So he got to the tomb and he saw, he, he looked in and he saw the, the, the garments there left by Jesus. But what does Peter do? John says, well, Peter charged in. He just went straight into the tomb and he looked and he saw. But the word that he uses for what Peter saw was the word theore, which means to examine, to consider, to like, to decipher, to perceive. So this is like what an investigator does. Like you and I might see a crime scene and see tape. We go, oh, I saw a crime scene over there. But, but you know, a, a, a crime scene investigator is going to go over there. What they see is a different kind of seeing. Like they're looking for certain details and they're considering all these things. Two different, two di totally two different things. And neither one of those is what John is using in 1 John chapter 1. It's a different word. It's the Greek word horeo. Well, what sets up the context for this word? Well, I'll give you a, one place that sets up the context for this word. It's in John 20, 18. Mary Magdalene uses it, and she says, I have seen the Lord. That's Resurrection Sunday. When she says, I have seen, here's, here's the connection with this word horeo. It's connected to belief. It's to see, and it's, it's usually always in the New Testament, whenever it's used, it's usually always connected to belief and faith in Jesus in this sense. So it's the kind of seeing that, that has led to belief, not in something, but in, but in Jesus. In fact, in him. Jesus, I have seen him. Hooray. I, I have seen him. It's the same word Jesus uses later to talk about, uh, we see when the discussion about Thomas, remember the guy who doubted? Well, it's later in uh, John chapter 20. Um, it says that uh, Thomas doubts, John chapter 20, starting in verse 24. But one of the 12 Thomas, called twin, was not with them when Jesus came, so what are the other disciples saying? The other disciples kept telling him, we have seen the Lord. That's Horea. We've seen, like, so we're, it's the kind of sight, like, we believe, we believe we have, that kind of seeing. It's not just seeing with the eyes or just examining with the mind, but man, we, it, it's locked in. Totally in. We have seen the Lord. And Thomas said, as you know, he said, well, unless I see, remember that? He said, unless I see, I, I won't, I won't believe. But listen to what Jesus says. Jesus uses this word that that John uses in 1 John 1, 2, in verse 27 of John chapter 20. Jesus said, because you have seen me, you have believed. That's horeo. Because you have seen me, you have believed. But Jesus said, those who believe without seeing me are blessed. John says in 1 John 1, 1, that which we have seen with our eyes. That's horeo. So it's more of like a comprehension. Like we just like saw a sighting of Jesus like it's Bigfoot. Saying we have seen him. Case closed. We have, we have understood. We have seen Jesus for who he is. And he's, his invitation is look. We have, we, have, we have heard. We have seen. We have, we have witnessed. We have, we have touched with our hands. We are declaring this to you. So that you too can have fellowship with God and also with us. When the Christ child Jesus was born, he came as the Lamb of God. He would willingly lay down his perfect sinless life, taking our place, our punishment for sin on the cross, and resurrect resurrecting back to life on the third day. He would offer us that same 
resurrection life to whosoever would come. That's what he said. That life. See, because he, he died so that he could offer that kind of life. Not to make your good life better, but for dead, transgressing sinners, he offered a way for them to be made alive and right with God again. And it has to be received just like a Christmas gift. Pretty, pretty awesome. Look at this. I'll turn there too. John chapter 1. This prologue of the Gospel of John, very similar to 1 John and John. What John says in John 1, verse 12, he says, But to all who did receive him, he gave them the right to be children of God to those who believe in his name. Have you seen Jesus? I mean in this, with your heart. God's gift of life has to be seen with your, with your heart. John says, we did that. We saw him. But see, what Jesus told Thomas was, well, blessed are those who have who believe and yet have, have not seen. What in the world does that mean? Well, Jesus is talking about there's a more important kind of seeing. It's right here. Have you seen your need for Jesus? Have you seen? Have you seen what's going to happen to your life without Jesus? Maybe that's a more important picture to, to, question to ask. Have you recognized exactly what, where you're headed? Have you realized exactly the gravity of the situation? The God of the universe sent his only son? Have you realized what will happen if we don't pay attention to this, if you don't catch Jesus, if you don't see him like, like they saw him from the heart, oh my goodness, the, the ramifications are exponential. But the invitation is, to all who did receive him, he gave them the right to become the child of God. So again, it's that child. You're going to hold that Christmas gift, and you're adults. You're going to hold it too. You're going to open that gift. You're going to touch it with your hands. You're going to see it with your eyes. John says, we did that concerning the word of life. My wife, my wife and I, Cindy, you know, we, it's Christmas time, so we got to do Christmas shopping. And my kids aren't in here. They're in, they're, they were in first service, and I can be a little more free with that. You know, we go on a mission, right? And some, sometimes you find stuff online, but some of the stuff is in the store. And so if she's searching for something in the store, we'll text back and forth. And you know what? If she tells me that she has found at the store this thing that we're looking for, I don't need to see it for myself. You know, he said, well, just hang right there because I don't really believe you. I'm going to drive over there 20 minutes across town down there to Sarasota Square. Like that would be insulting, number one. But number two, I mean, how, how dense do I have to be, right? But say, vice versa, like if I say, hey, they actually have it at this store or whatever. She's like, we'll get it. We'll get it. See, John's saying, let me save you the legwork. We have seen him. We've seen it. But in fact, that you don't, you don't need to see him to have fellowship with God and with us. You just need to see, like with your eyes, you just need to see with your, with your heart, to see and believe in your heart. That's all. See, this is God's text message. And, you know, John wrote that. Here's his text message. He's like, they have it in stock. They have it. Just, just trust me. Trust me. Take my word for it. We got to see him so that you don't have to. It's been so much easier. Now it's just a gift. You just, you just receive it, but you've got to receive it for yourself. What is the best thing? It will absolutely change your life. It will change Christmas. Have you really seen Christmas? You've seen the lights. You've read the story. You've heard the language. But have you really seen it? Have you really understood that Jesus came for you? He came for you. We're going to miss the whole thing if we don't see it with our heart. And I want to invite you to, to pray with me right now. Father, I just lift up anyone in this room who's been struggling. They, if they were to admit it and be honest, they maybe, don't, they maybe don't have a relationship with you. And they're struggling as to what to do with that. Lord, I just pray that they'd turn to you today. They'd receive your gift of salvation like I did when I was seven years old. Some people in this room did when they were 17. Some people in this room may have done it when they were 70. It, does, it just doesn't matter. And if that's you this morning, I'm just going to, here, here's that relationship starts with a, with a request and a prayer that goes something like this. And you can just say it in your heart back to him. Say, Jesus, I admit to you, I am a sinner. I recognize my, my deep need for you. Thank you for, not just for coming into this world, but for dying for my sins on the cross. I believe that you also rose again from the dead so that you could offer me life. And I want to experience 
that life. I want to receive you as the solution to my sin problem. And I want to follow you from this day forward. If you prayed that prayer today, you, want, you need to know that Jesus said, said yes to you. You didn't have to be good enough to earn it. It's just a grace gift. Father, for, for the rest of us in this room today, help us to not, to not look past in all the busyness and all the memories of, of, of Christmases before this one. Help us not to lose sight of the significance of exactly what has happened, exactly what all these things point to, so that we'll see you clearly and we'll be able to share you and speak about you boldly and point others to the light of Christmas. That's you, Jesus. Thank you that your light shined in the darkness and the darkness did not overcome it. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. I wanna invite you to do this. Uh, at the beginning of the service, you know, there's those white connect, Get Connected cards in the back of your seat. If you made a decision to trust Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior today, you need one of those cards. You need to, to tell us about that. That's gonna be really significant in your spiritual life. You can do that on our app as well, on our website. You can find that card digitally and do the same thing there, but tell somebody because I want to tell you, buckle up. If that was you today, this might just be the best Christmas of your life to this point. It makes a difference seeing Jesus from your heart. Love you guys. Have a great rest of your afternoon. Merry Christmas. You are dismissed.